was cold. So you got to hire a boy from work. Cool, and a good main new friend. So her and I had a great conversation. That's great. And it was, it was awesome to be able to, you know, I haven't been able to really relate with, instead of outside of church, you know, with someone who's Christian. And it, it, was, it was pretty nice. Amen. Jill? I just wanted to say, I finally got my raise. Yeah. Yeah. yeah! And they actually gave me a dollar instead of 50 cents. Woo! That's, a, that's an hour, not a week, right? <laughs> <laughs> you don't know the dollar. You don't know the dollar. That's a month. Not a dollar a week. A dollar a month? Yeah. 50 cents a month. Something like that. <laughs> <laughs> dollar a minute. Yeah. All right. Make it yeah. a dollar a minute. And we'll call it a with a dollar a minute, that's pretty, that's pretty awesome. I'll come work for someone. I'm going to bring up the request for one line. If I just go ahead and, uh, Father, we thank you, Lord, for everyone here tonight, and uh, we pray for those who can't be here because of work and uh, travel and uh, illness or uh, injury or whatever the case may be. We have several people out, Lord. We just lift them up to you, and we do pray you come quickly. As we were talking uh, in our fellowship time, we, we know there's still a lot of people lost. As long as we're here, we want to be faithful to preach the gospel. Amen. We want to be with you. We want to see you and be in your presence. And so uh, we do want to lift up at least request uh, Brother Larry and uh, his boys, uh, Jake and Ryan. And uh, we just pray, Lord, your hand would be upon them. And you'd be able to just bless them and help them in their walk with you and going through life's difficulties. Pray for uh, Betty Evans' son who's going through a nasty divorce. We we'll just pray, Lord, that you'd help him. <clears throat> and Brother uh, Jonathan Watson been able to replace uh, his pleco uh, killer that passed away on him with the monster. And we just pray, Lord, that uh, that'll work out and that. Not, as he said, not uh, replacing, but succeeding uh, killer. And they would be a friend to Jonathan and uh, provide companionship. And we uh, want to lift up Brother John Hartman, who has requested uh, just, you know the details. He just wants uh, to improve his personal walk with you. And we we'll just pray that you'll help him. And uh, we know you will. We uh, pray for Brother Doug as he heads down to Florida, safety, and he'll have a good time on his trip. We lift up uh, Lewis with his back injury. Lord, we pray you have some mercy there, and that can be a very Amen. painful thing. Be hard to sleep and, and all that. We just pray you help him to overcome that. Brother Mark and his need for a truck. Amen. We'll guide him, and he'll be able to find a good one. Yes. Uh, Charlie and his issues with uh, just trying to deal with the schedule that he's on. And, and uh, we have others with work-related issues. We yeah. just lift them up to you, Lord. We're thankful that uh, we hear some of the good things that have happened this week. Uh, Janie and uh, the experience she had getting a ride on that day with that lady. And uh, Jill and the pay rate she's been given. We're thankful for that. Uh, we thank you for the way you have protected us. Uh, all, uh, all five of us Saturday at the game and the uh, inclement weather and the bad traffic and everything. We just Amen. thank you for being able to have a good time and get home safely. Amen. Thank you. And uh, so many things we're thankful for. Stephen and Mariah and Gloria making it back safely. Uh, flying down and back to North Carolina. And 
all these things, Lord, we're, we're thankful for. We don't ever want to take for granted. Amen. We live in a fallen world, bad things happen. We're just thankful for your mercy. We're thankful for salvation. And we, it's all about Jesus. Amen. And so we lift up his precious name in song. We lift up these prayers in his precious name. Amen. Amen. All right, let's go ahead and sing that song number 20 or 52. forth from John to Steve, but uh, Brother Steve will be teaching in the morning uh, Bible study. Ooh. Just one more time, I'll tell you, and we'll, we'll probably mention it again Sunday morning, but it's open Bible study. It's it's like a Sunday school class, only we study the Bible, unlike most Sunday schools today. Hey. Right. <laughs> That's right. And we're going to have open Bible discussion, meaning that uh, it, it means 
We're going to talk about the text. It's not a time to talk about the flat earth or Mandela effect or, you know, uh, reptilians and all that stuff. It's time to study the Bible, and we're Amen. going to be in the book of Romans. Amen. Chapter 1, verse 1, and we'll get as far as we get. Amen? Amen. And then next week, Stephen will pick up wherever Brother John left off. So, be there. And then the next day, Jim Ganaw says ragweed season is over. Uh, Woohoo! Uh -huh. Good times. Amen. And then uh, the following Saturday, the 15th, mark your calendars. Be here at 9.30 a.m. with your work clothes on. We're going to uh, party. Oh, yeah. Work party. Food? Is there food? Of course. When do you ever come here and there not be food? <laughs> I think it's happened. We'll have something. The first day we came. Yes, the first day when we checked out the building. We had food. We just didn't have a spread. There's, you know, we'll have, <laughs> we'll have, we'll have, we'll have snacks and things and uh, maybe go to lunch and hang out mm. a little bit. You know, play it by ear. Is your ear um, very good? Let's play it by hand instead. Yeah, I think hands would be better. I'm trying to think. Of, I think the football game doesn't start till like 3.30 that day. Are you yeah, going to that one? Like Rutgers. What? Do we that's have a game the 15th? That's the Rutgers game, yeah. Rutgers is this weekend, I think. Yeah. No, yeah, you're right. This will, be the, this will be the one I think that they're in Texas. No, that's the third one. Third game. That'll it's, be the third game. 15th, they'll be in Texas. So in other words, we have no yeah. reason to not come. We went to the first one. Next week's Rutgers, and the week after that's in Texas. Yeah. So that's probably why I scheduled this one that day. Mm, <laughs> smart. Then uh, the 21st, we'll have another movie night. Yay. And uh, we'll talk more about that. And then uh, we already have our pizza. Just a reminder, the pizza comes first in October because the first Wednesday is before the first Sunday. Be thinking about what we want to have as a theme the first uh, Sunday. And then Jenny and I will be, uh, we'll be here for that. And we'll be leaving the next day for a little getaway. Oh. Then uh, Brother John will be teaching that Wednesday. Oh. And uh, so, good times, amen. amen. All right, we'll have a class. Silence your cell phones, if you would, please. We already have prayer. Current events update before we get into our Q&A tonight. I, oh, I got to show you this. I showed a few people online. I saw this Isn't that great? Mm -hmm. Reserved for green vehicles. So <laughs> does that mean if we'll get to stay? Because green vehicles means like hybrids. And it kind of looks parked there. It kind of what's parked there is a green vehicle. That looks kind of cool But it's a me. green truck, not a, you know. I think it's more teal. So, oh, did everybody, oh does everybody God. understand the joke? Oh my Amen. Oh my <laughs> it's green. Oh my it's a gas guzzling green pickup. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a hydrocarbon powered eco vehicle. There you go. <laughs> Here's our real update. So I just good. wanted you to see that uh, it's uh, over wow. England. We love our, we're going to say this before I get started. We love our English brethren. Amen. We appreciate all the Bible believing Christians. They're a remnant, but they're there. Yes. But the government is fascist. The yes. United Kingdom government is a fascist government that controls its people, and you can be thrown in prison for doing, for simply preaching the gospel. Uh, Tommy Robinson was thrown in prison for simply doing a live stream in front of a courthouse in which the Muslim men were being tried for gang raping young women. And they got off. And uh, they got, I don't know what happened with that. I have to be honest with you. they got off both of them. And uh, Tommy went to jail. <laughs> He's out now, I believe. But... So uh, this is an example of what's going on in the UK here. Um, the Christian Institute in the United Kingdom is lamenting that contemporary society has become so intolerant that a simple Bible tract stating pride leads to disgrace is being treated as hate speech. The gay pride thing is what that's, but it's now it's LGBTQRSTUVWXYZ. Alphabet. And the track, by the way, was really tame. Sounds like I mean, that's the front of it, and it has the pride flag 
what comes after pride. But uh, this, the story, this is WND, World Net Daily, WND.com. And the front of the track, by the way, used the Christian flag, the Bible flag, a uh, uh, rainbow, I should say, flag. It had seven of the, the colors of the spectrum. The pride flag, as they call it, has six. The number of man, the number of the beast. Remember we talked about the Antichrist of Sodom. The front of the track has seven color rainbow with the question, what comes after pride? Oh, did I turn this on? Yeah, I did, okay. Can you, is that on? I just wanna make it sure is, I did. Yes, no. <clears throat> Local reports said it was from an organization called Expand Christianity, which published uh, an online track similar to the one that you saw on the uh, previous slide. And inside is a familiar biblical warning to those who read their Bible that pride goes before a fall. Right. <laughs> yeah. And if the Bible isn't talking about that, what is it talking about? A bunch of proud sodomites out walking around half naked or all the way naked and doing all kinds of simulated sex acts in the street. I'd say that's pretty much what that scripture's talking about. And it says inside uh, this, this biblical warning, the world defines pride as a feeling or, or deep pleasure or satisfaction derived from one's own achievements, the achievements of those with whom one is closely associated, or from qualities or possessions that are widely admired. It's now admirable to be a sodomite. Oh. Yet oh. the Word of God says a person's pride is followed by disgrace, Proverbs 11, 2. Uh, pride is arrogance. Proverbs 21, 24. Pride will bring a person low. Proverbs 29, 23. Now listen, here's what I want you to understand. First sentence up here, if you can't see it, I'll read it. It doesn't mention gays, LGBTQ, or same-sex issues. Wow. It sh yeah, I'm just going to say it, it should. Amen. And even, in the, and the idea that that would be a crime is fascist. That's Hitler, Mussolini, Nazi. Mussolini was the fascist. Hitler was the Nazi. I better get that straight or I'll get email. The Christian Institute Deputy Director, uh, I can't pronounce the first name. Kelly is the last name. It looks like CIA. Ceron or whatever. Yeah. No, that's CLA. I don't even know if that is that a man's name or a woman's name. Whatever, Director Kelly. Director Kelly <laughs> says, quote, I think it's very sad that this has been used to attack Christianity. I think it's very sad that what is essentially a Bible tract is being called extremist literature. <laughs> this seems to be the norm these days. Whenever there is a view that is expressed that people don't like, rather than engaging with it in any kind of way, they call you a bigot and they call you uh, extremist. And um, the uh, charge is that um, this is, you know, fundamentalist Christian literature, which suggests links between the LGBT community being evil and destruction. Amen. <laughs> and, uh, it claims the rainbow on the track is an internationally recognized the LGBT flag. But Kelly, who a lot of Christians don't know this, but Kelly does, pointed out that the track has a seven color rainbow, not the six color used by the LGBT community. Amen. Amen. So technically, <laughs> even their charge is false. And, um, but this other guy said it revealed, it, or, or he's talking about, Kelly is saying about the uh, people accusing them that it reveals an ignorance of Christianity. God had first dibs on the rainbow. Amen. 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 So that's going on over there in the, Q, in, in the uh, UK, and it's going to get worse. Yeah, Johnny? I'll just comment. I guess good for them they did that they did, but they were painted a doom town track, huh? Yeah. yeah. They would have gone They would have gone berserk then if they... We're going nuts over this one. <laughs> UK now should stand for UK. We did have a 
have. I'm going to route it like that. Oh, here it is. Doom Town. I think there was one more. Uh, Check this one called the Gay Blight. I think there was. The group one that hated them for doing that was Christians. Probably. Yeah. But uh, if you can see that, the Doom Town is the uh, chick tract about Sodom. Hand those out and see if you don't get in trouble if you hang around. Yeah. In some ways, it's, it gets more, it's a bit more graphic than the, than the part of the Bible it's talking about, actually, because they... Well, it's talking about in today's uh, setting, but... but I'm pretty, yeah, I'll, I'll bet it's exactly what happened back then, too. Yeah, the, the, we, the Sunday school material kind of glosses over the reality of the wickedness. Um, I always thought we were talking about this today, uh, you know, like someone wearing a Trump t-shirt today. You have to be careful doing that. You go in like a Make America Great hat on, they say they're spitting your food and all kinds of things. Because, you know, they're so loving. Yeah. But uh, the same thing's true with gospel tracks. You know, if you go out with the gospel track, uh, we leave them with our tip after we've eaten. Yeah. <laughs> After they pump the gas, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Wise as serpents, harmless as doves. Amen. Amen. But, you know, when I stand out on the street, hand out gospel tracts or something, and sometimes you got to risk it if you're going to get the message out. And uh, we had the experience on Morse Road down there where we were standing with the sign um, that says homosexuals choose uh, sin turn to Jesus instead and be saved and the gospel message along with that and they had, they had three or four people in a car try to drive up on the sidewalk and run over us and uh, we weren't out there trying to provoke someone to run over us obviously but you got to be willing to to do that I do not agree with these some people go out there and they yell at them and call them names and that kind of thing I'm not and that Westboro Baptist, you know, their stuff. I don't agree with all that. But if you're just preaching the gospel and confronting them with their sin, you're doing the right thing. Amen. So we're going to do a uh, Q&A, and then you can have your questions ready. Um, I want to answer a couple that I already have prepared, and then we'll open the phone lines and take calls. <laughs> I'm sitting by. But the first Q&A, first question, why do you teach that repentance is not a work? Now, I'm just giving you the way that it's the, peop, the way people ask me the question. And the answer, why do you teach that repentance is not a work, is because it is not a work. <laughs> but specifically, because it is not a work you do, but one God does in you. Amen. Now, sadly, some people, because they don't want to have to preach repentance when they preach the gospel, they try to say that, well, repentance is something that happens after you're saved. That's not how the Bible teaches it. Amen. Uh, up on our wall, we don't have it up now. Um, let's go to Acts 5.31 first. Acts chapter 5 and verse 31. Answering the question, is, is repentance a work? Now before we read this, if I give you a gift... But I tell you, before I give you the gift, you have to cut my grass. <laughs> Jim, would you consider that a gift? Yes, sir. You're earning it, aren't you? <laughs> well, Acts 5.31, if you want to, read that with me. Him that hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Repentance is no more a work than is forgiveness of sins. The Bible says that God hath exalted a, a prince and a savior. Who is that? Jesus. This is talking about the Jews in Israel after the resurrection of Jesus Christ being confronted with their need to repent. And it says that God will give repentance to Israel Amen. and forgiveness of sins. Now he gave that to uh, a couple of chapters from here, 
chapter 9, he gave it to a fellow named Saul, who became Paul, who wrote most of our New Testament, most of the, most of the epistles. <clears throat> He's had a remnant of Jewish believers down through the years. There's Jewish believers today. They're a remnant, but they're here. And then at the end of the tribulation, those who have survived and are alive at the end of that tribulation says they will look upon him whom they pierced. They will mourn as for a, an only son because they had rejected him up to that point. So what does that mean? That means repentance is not a work, it's a gift. Another one just a couple pages over. Acts chapter 11 and verse 18. Acts chapter 11, I'll read verse 17. For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? Read verse 18. When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. See, a lot of people say, well, that first verse is talking about Israel, and that was in the transition or something, blah, blah, blah. Well, this is talking about Gentiles. Yep. And it says repentance is a gift. Amen. Now, I just have to explain it. People want to get away from preaching repentance because what they want to do is define repentance if they do preach it. They define it as a change of mind, and all you are doing is acknowledging that you're a sinner who needs to be saved. So that means that I can convince somebody to say a little prayer with me and to claim to be saved without repentance because that's not really repentance. That's part of repentance, but it's not really repentance. Yeah. If I take a $50 bill and rip it in half and give half to Jim and half to John, how much can Jim and John spend of that $50 bill separately? It gives it a we can do it pretty separately, you can't spend it. <laughs> That's what they're doing with repentance. They're ripping it in half, yep. and they're trying to spend based on half of the, yep. the bill. Amen. Repentance is more than just acknowledging that you're a sinner and you need to be saved, and it's not a work. And, uh, well, before we go there, go to Acts chapter 20. A few more pages. Acts chapter 20. And people say, well, that, that's still, I think that is the hyper dividers, hyper dispensationalists, they'll say that Acts 11 was still in a transition. So we come down to Acts chapter 20. And only the most extreme hyper dispensationalists will try to claim that this is still during a trans transition. Uh, some are called Acts 15. They call themselves Acts 15 yeah. uh, hyper, or they will call themselves hyper. Uh, they'll call themselves Acts 15 dispensationalists or something like that. Well, this is Acts 20, so it's after that. Read verse 21 with me. This is the Pauline ministry, by the way. This is Paul's ministry. Amen. Read verse 21 with me. Testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. If preaching repentance is preaching works, then Paul preached works. But Paul didn't preach works because repentance is not a work. Amen. And so that... Uh, well, let's go ahead and look at 2 Timothy 2.25 because, again, this is way past that transition period. And this is after the book of Acts is completed. 2, cha 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 25. And uh, verse 24 says, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. Verse 25, read it. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the knowledge of the truth. And uh, verse 26, it goes on saying that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. That's talking about a lost man. It's talking about somebody who is uh, captive of the devil, snared by the devil, and they don't have the truth. If you don't have the truth today and you're in the cap you're a captive of Satan, you need to be saved. Amen. <laughs> and uh, 
we will instruct these people, as we do, trying to uh, instruct them that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance. So I think we buried that one pretty good. Amen. Repentance is a result of a sinner receiving the truth of God's Word. That's really what happens. You receive the truth of God's Word, then God works in you and produces repentance. 1 Thessalonians 2.13 describes this process where repentance, faith, and everything else you receive from God, coming from God's Word, begins with this. For this cause, this is 1 Thessalonians 2.13, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received... The word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Amen. Now you know why the entire public education system, from head start to graduate school, is set to talk you out of believing the Bible is the Word of God because Satan's behind it. Right. Satan wants you to doubt that book. That's why if you turn on their TV and you watch anything in any way related to the Bible, including science, they will constantly try to undermine your faith in God's Word on PBS, on the History Channel, A and E, I mean, whatever, whatever you know, name the station, secular stations, anytime they hit on touch on these things, they will try to talk you out of believing the Bible because of that. Because Satan is behind it, and Satan, if he wants to keep you captive and keep you from turning to God with repentance and faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ, he all he has to do, he doesn't have to get you on crack, on heroin, in adultery, fornication, he doesn't have to get you into some kind of big sin. If he wants to keep you captive and keep you from turning to God, all he has to do is make sure you do not receive this word as the word of God. Yeah. And that's the mark of the age of apostasy. That's the mark of the times as it was in the days of Noah, as it was in the days of Lot. The people reject the word of God. They don't believe it is the Word of God. They believe it's the Word of men. And you see it all over the place on social media and the Internet. And people comment about the Bible. That's just a book written by a bunch of holy men. Just, you know, and there's no, you know, blah, blah, blah. They, and I had some guy, you know, tell me that yesterday. And I told him, I said, you know, you, you come on here against me like that. you're arrogant. And you act like you think you know something. And I said, here, learn something for a minute. And I showed him where he was wrong. And I said, your problem is you're ignorant and you're arrogant. And until you learn the truth and stop being so arrogant, you're hopeless. Yep. Amen. But that describes most of the people we deal with yeah. in the lost world. Now, here's a follow-up question on repentance. Isn't being willing to turn from sins works? You see, when you preach repentance, um, if you go to a lexicon, it says it's a change of mind. The Bible doesn't say that, but your lexicon will. Yeah. And in your lexicon, it'll basically uh, say, and, and a lot of preachers will preach it, as I said a moment ago, that it is a change of mind about your condition. You acknowledge you're lost and need saved. But the Bible teaches that when you're repentant, that it's a change of your heart, not just the head knowledge, but the heart confession is made unto salvation, Romans says. Amen. And when you, you read about God, God doesn't repent of sins, but God repents. And when he repents, for example, of wiping out an entire race, and he repents, it says, but it grieved him in his heart. See, it's a heart matter. In God's own heart is where he grieves. Right. And so uh, it is a work in the sense that it is a work of God in you, not a wor work performed by you. The, in other words, repentance isn't like baptism. Repentance isn't like giving an offering. Repentance isn't like church membership. 
repentance isn't any of those things that a lot of people will say, you know, well, they think they're saved because they've done those things. Well, those are works, and you're not saved by works. But repentance is, as, as we read in Acts 20, 21, it's repentance toward God. And what these guys a lot of times will say is, well, it's, it doesn't have anything to do with sins. <coughs> if you're not repenting toward God away from your sin, then you're not, then you're not repenting. And I've had people say, well, what do you think repentance is? What are you repenting of? It's real simple, folks. Everything. Amen. When you get saved, you're like, I drop it all, Lord. And you don't even know really in, in detail what exactly you need to drop, but you just drop it all and turn to God with nothing in your hands. You don't come to Him with your pedigree, your bank account, your church membership, your good looks, whatever it is. And you don't come to Him with your sin. You don't come to Him and say, well, I'm a proud sodomite, Lord, but I acknowledge I need to be saved. Save me, although I'm going to continue being a sodomite. But that's what's being preached today. Yeah. I'm going to tell you, that's being preached in fundamental Baptist churches. Yeah. And in addition to that, what's being preached, or what's being taught, is among this thing called gay Christianity. Yeah. Gay Christian 101. Mm -hmm. Repentance means to change your mind. Wow, that's like tip top. There are some men out there who, because they think they're protecting the gospel from being preached wrongly and they, they don't want to preach works and they have a false definition of repentance, so they think they can't preach repentance because it's a work. Well, we just saw it's not a work. Error begets error. Heresy begets heresy. If you think repentance is a work and you don't preach repentance, you're preaching a sodomite gospel. Yep. It's a gospel for this age, this Laodicean sodomite false church age. That's right. And a lot of the guys preaching it are fundamentalists. Fundamental Baptists. Independent fundamental Baptists. IFB. Now they tell you, oh, I'm not supporting the homosexuals, no blah, blah, blah. Yes, you are. If you're preaching that, you are. Because what's happening is, on this website, you can find out exactly how to find a church that you like. And if it's not, if it's a church like ours, where they call us, we're not gay friendly, see, because we don't accommodate it. So they say, well, then you go, you, you, you go to a church like this, but live far enough away that the people who go to church don't see you all the time. That way you can continue living your lifestyle and the people in the church won't see you. Yeah. And then you get in there and you get on the membership roll, you keep it all to yourself, and then as time goes, you help them, you help enlighten the people. Kind of the way Calvinism takes over a church, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Satan, Satan doesn't have different tactics, he just has different uh, themes and different things that will throw at you, you know? Yeah. Stage sets. Amen. Yeah, stage sets. And so uh, they do that. I'll tell you another one that they do that. It's charismatics. Yep. Charismatics will come in church, and they won't say anything about the fact that they they believe in speaking in tongues and being slain in the Spirit and everything, and then once they're there for a little while, they're going to start trying to get people to come for little Bible studies, they'll call it, yeah. that it end up being little yeah. prayer meetings where they'll start to get people a little more emotional and get people to start doing these things. And then once enough of those people in the church are showing up to do those things, then they start trying to do it during the regular services. Yeah. And yeah. preachers have stopped it and lost half their church, or other preachers said, well, you know, hey, there's more people, more money. That's sad. I'm done, but I'm done, I'm done. You know, they just start doing it too. Yeah, that's right. Money, money, money. And so you got these IFB preachers who know that if they preach repentance, they won't have as many numbers to brag about. And they won't have as many people sitting in the pews. And so because it you know just increases the flow, they decide repentance is a work. I'm not going to preach that anymore. And so I'm going to reach more people. What good is that if you're reaching them with the false gospel? And so more and more of the people coming into independent fundamental Baptist churches are closet queers. And they come in and they start to add up their numbers 
And a lot of times their parents and grandparents go there. And so they don't want the preacher to offend them. So they start pressuring the preacher to be a little nicer and not to preach against that stuff as much. And on down the, 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 the end of the pit. That's what's going on. There's, there's a, uh, here's one here. This is, would you love a gay affirming church? Mm. How to destroy it. You and you, you read that article there, and they, they help you to understand the differences in churches. What about being out of the church? You know, well, if it's a church that will uh, accommodate you, then fine. If not, then, you know, use wisdom and don't be real out about it. So there you go. That's what's behind. And it, I'm telling you, there's a lot of these guys that say, well, I'm not that. I'm against the homosexual thing. I don't care what your intentions are. In practical reality, you're part of the problem. You're part of the sodomizing of the church. It's no more a work than is changing your mind about your sinful condition. Condition. That's the irony. These guys who will say that you're preaching works if you preach repentance is a willingness to turn from sins. They preach that repentance is changing your mind. Well, that's something you're doing. <laughs> so that's a work too. Amen? Here's what Jesus says. What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. Amen. Amen. This is what kind of uh, provoked this whole question in an email. Was this thing here is at the back of all the chick tracks. If you hand out a chick track, you come to the end, and it says... The Bible says there's only one way to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, John 14, 6. Nobody else can save you. Trust Jesus today, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart, Amen. not a change of mind, heart, that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved, Romans 10, 9. Number one, admit you are a sinner. But see, that's where these guys stop. Number two, be willing to turn from sin, parentheses, repent. Amen. See Acts 17, 30. Let's go there. Acts chapter 17, verse 30. Verse 29 says, For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is likened to gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's devices. So the context is the sin of idolatry. Verse 30, read that. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. There you go. Then it says... Believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and rose from the dead. See Romans 10, 19. Why? Because Paul said that that's what the gospel is how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And Paul said he preached that gospel and then called on all men to repent toward God with faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the Pauline ministry. Amen. All right. Anything else on that before we move on? I think we nailed that down pretty good. Yeah. I mean, if somebody don't get that, that's because they don't want to get that. Johnny? I would just so just to comment on this. So I suppose when they're, you know, the false gospel they're coming up with, it's sort of, I guess, backwards and only half there. Yeah. Because, because we, yeah, we saw right there, it's um, the, the change in your mind is almost there, but that would that's only that would only be connected to believing, which is which also needs to be deeper in the heart, and so that I, then. That well, the now I don't want to. I just want to say, don't complicate it. Right. Change your mind is half the message. 
But if you only change your mind right. and you don't change your heart and turn toward God, then you haven't repented. Yeah. yeah. Amen. Now, if you, you, you do have to change your mind and acknowledge you're a sinner and yeah. then repent invo involves also then changing your heart, repenting toward God. There's a turning. Now, yeah. it's not a work because it's not physical. I, use, I do that to give you kind of a visual. This is all taking place inside here. And it's not works. Yeah. It's the basically the whole process of regeneration and being born again. Okay, and you don't break it down into pieces except to understand it. But the actual event just happens. <laughs> you know, it's not a step one, do this. Step two, do that. I, mean, that. I don't have a problem with the one, two, three, four to help people understand what's going on. But it doesn't happen, step one, check, step two. It is, I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm on my way to hell. I'm sorry for my sins, willing to turn and be saved. I'm trusting in the finished work of Christ on the cross, his shed blood, and the power of his resurrection, I am saved. Amen. And that's, that's one of the ways we know that there is, that you know, it's the act of taking place inside. Mm -hmm. Because if, it, if, it, you know, if you could define believing, like they said, as a work, then, it, then and, and, you know, no work to get to heaven. Well, and the, the question is, what kind of work? There's works you do, and there's works God does in you. Yeah. See, the works of God are the works he does, the works of God, the works he does in you. Amen. That's the repentance and the faith is in you based on the work of God and the work of God is a result of his word. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's all what God's doing in you. All right, any uh, questions that or anything else? How about on the live stream? Live stream, we have one person so far. <clears throat> um, do, 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 do. Cutting edge technology. Okay, Mark Barber, he asks, how do we know that God approves of our Constitution? And the second one, and when it comes to slaves and the Constitution, like, can you give some insight? Why the yes. is allowed it? Romans 13, he probably knows I was going to Yes, there. he says, I know Pastor Greg quotes Romans 13, one for this, but a little more insight would be helpful. Romans 13, if you want to go there. Uh, so could you repeat the question? The question is, uh, the... How do we know that the Constitution was given to us by God? And uh, the second part was regarding slavery in, in specific, in specifically to our Constitution, our government. Now, um, the first part of the question is Romans 13, verse 1. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. This is a tough one, but it's a reality. And I believe it goes this way. It, basically, it's the majority of the people in that country that God usually seems to, re, to respond to. You get the government you deserve. Yeah. For example, um, the United States of America, when we first set up a government, um, we, uh, we had a lot of morally decent people that included a lot of Christians, even the ones who weren't Christian, had a higher moral standard than today's Americans. Amen. Mm -hmm. And by the way, there was no real thing like pornography uh, and very little prostitution and that sort of thing. Now, that included the slaves, and here's the reality of the slaves. The slaves were largely a Muslim thing. Hmm. And Barbary pirates, these are Muslims, yeah. made the slave trade what it became. But there were then men in Europe and in England especially, and then later in America, who also got involved in the slave trade. But that also included some black Americans, black English, black European, and black African. The slave trade was a result not of one particular race taking advantage of another as much as it was greed. Now, the larger part of the slave 
population was from Africa. But again, a lot of those were sold by their own people. Mm -hmm. They came over here and the, um, the reality is that Africa at that time, like I said, just like Romans 13, they deserved what they had over there. They had turned to darkness. It's like Haiti today. You go to the island of Haiti, it's a dark place. Yeah. Yeah, and that's why it's such a mess. Now, um, a good number of the slaves who came to America were treated badly. But the majority actually were better off here than they were over in Africa. And then they were converted to Christianity. Amen. Many of them taught to read. They began, and now they were forced to have their own churches. It was totally seg segregated. And, um, and there's a lot to that. I can't, don't have time to go into all that. But slavery in the United States of America was, is something that it was bad. And our country is divided because of it even today. Yeah. Still to this day. But some of the slaves, especially after the Civil War, actually have been better off now and where they are in their families, their gen the generations afterward, than they would have been if they'd stayed in Africa. Yeah. Oh, amen. So God doesn't, um, I don't believe God was behind the slave trade, but God works all things together for good to them that amen. love him. And, there are, and are they called according to his purpose? And so there have been a large number of slave descendants who have prospered in this country. And uh, uh, I don't know, you know, there's a lot of questions that could go along with that, but I believe that God um, established our constitution based on what we read here. Uh, Fidel Castro, for example, I believe that if enough Cubans would have been godly people and would have supported um, uh, the right form of government, then Castro would have never taken over Cuba. Amen. And there's a reason why the United States of America has established this constitutional republic. It's because of the uh, influence. We were talking downstairs. No other country has the freedom of speech and religion that the United States of America has. Go over to England, and we just, I just showed you what's going on there. Um, you go into Europe, they're, they're arresting Christians for uh, hate speech. Now, it is, the liberals in this country would have America be like that. Mm -hmm. That's why they're arresting cake bakers and flower, flora, florists, I guess they're called, for not doing sodomite marriages, for example. In Canada, Canada doesn't, doesn't really have a, a freedom of speech the way we do either. Yeah. And they, they arrest people up there for human rights violations if you speak out against homosexuality and that sort of thing. That's right. So that's a great question, a great study. Uh, I would recommend a book by William P. Grady, How Satan Turned America Against God. I don't know if we have that in there right now, but we will have that one in our library. If you read that book, William P. Grady, How Satan Turned America Against God, you'll get the answers you, you want. Mark, Barber, or anybody else listening, I recommend that book. I think there's also the, the book by William P. Grady called What Hath God Wrought? Now, combined, you're talking about 1,500 pages, <laughs> so it'll be a little while reading those, but they're packed full of history and information you want on that matter. All right, uh, here's a real important uh, quotation. I don't always hurty dermer flurp de flurpton, but when I do, I hear der schmer der herder frumpty der shoopin flurp de der. Mary Lynn, you ever watch the Muppets? Uh, that was very what's the sh What's the chef's name? I can't remember his name. Oh, it's just the sweetest chef. Uh, they just call him the sweetest chef? They're yeah. racist. So there's your uh, motiv motivator. What do they call it? Positive quote for the day. Yeah. <laughs> we got jokes. Uh, more? You got more? 
Oh, we have a question from Brother Brandon. He asked this in an email. We'll close with this one. Could you explain why Exodus 3.14 said the Lord repented of evil? Exodus 3.14. If you want to turn there. <laughs> this is similar to the thing of uh, repent. People give evil a definition that's not really correct and then a lot of the skeptics and atheists and people like to throw this out there as an accusation against God. Exodus 3.14. Wait a minute, have I got the right? 32. What? Wait a second. I got the wrong. Exodus 32.14. 32.14. Sorry. Right. Yes, I am who I am. Yeah, I was going to say that doesn't help. Sounds like it's a great passage, but not related. <laughs> Exodus 32, 14. Put a little two in there. That jot. All right. Could you explain why Exodus 32, 14 said the Lord repented of evil? And uh, just simply says, verse 13, Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou swearest by thine own self, and saidst unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. And verse 14, read that with me. And the, and the Lord, Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. Now, we read that, and it really comes down to context and word usage. Um, turn over to Job 42.11. Job was right before Psalm. And the Psalms page before that. Job 42, verse 11. Long verse. Verse 10 says, And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Verse 11 says, Then came there unto him all his brethren and all his sisters and all they that had been of his acquaintance before and did eat bread with him in his house. And they bemoaned him, and watch this, comforted him over all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. Every man also gave him a piece of money and every one an earring of gold. So the Lord says, comfort him over all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. And Job's wife was downright put out with God over this. <laughs> mm -hmm. She says, chapter 2, verse 9, 10, Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thy integrity? Curse God and die. But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. Right. What? Watch this. Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? In all this did not Job sin with his lips. Now let that sink in. We have to begin. Uh, it's an old saying. You have to begin right if you want to end right. The problem when a lot of people talk about God and these big questions about God, they start wrong. You know how they start wrong? They think too highly of themselves. First, you have to start correctly by understanding what we deserve. And, and I just want you to get that in your head. Think about that because it's not just when you're dealing with other people. Many times we want to stop and say, why God, why would you allow this? Why are you allowing me to go through this? What, 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 why? Why are we asking that question? Because we started out thinking we deserved something mm -hmm. better. We are entitled that entitlement attitude we're seeing in America today. Entitled to the best health care human beings have ever had. That's right. <laughs> Entitled to a retirement at, at a certain age. To be able to live like a queen or a king. Demanding what we deserve. Is that really a wise thing to do? We all ought to be in a lake of fire. We deserve hell and eternal damnation. We are wicked, our very nature. We sin so much that it would be impossible to make some sort of inventory of all the sin. And I'm just talking about me. I add one of you to it, and it's almost infinity. 
at this whole room, it might be. We have earned the wages of sin and can say, but for the grace of God and our Lord Jesus Christ, I would burn in hell. Right. Mm -hmm. That's where you got to start. Romans 5, 12 says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. And we'll put it this way, in practical terms, the first time you sin, you should be in hell. In reality, God would be just to throw us all in there before we sin. Because we are born in sin. But He's just... And he only holds people responsible who are conscious. And so once you become conscious of your need of salvation, you become conscious of right and wrong, you begin to choose what's wrong. We deserve nothing but hell. Now once you start there, you can start to see things clearly. The wages of sin is what? Death. Death. You've sinned, haven't you? then you've earned death. But <laughs> you're a winner. <laughs> Loser. <laughs> but the gift of God is eternal life. There we go with that gift again. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So we have to prayerfully shake our deception of entitlement. And then read passages like this that we've been reading, understanding that any good that the Lord does for us is undeserved, and any evil we suffer is less than what we truly deserve. Amen. Job had that understanding. Job lost everything and had boils from head to toe to boot on top of losing everything. And then a bunch of nagging friends and a nagging wife. Boy, ain't that living good. And Job still said, the Lord gives and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. God's part was what we call, for lack of better terms, his permissive will. If you read Job, you'll see that, that Satan wanted to test Job to prove something to God, and God allowed it to happen. The evil that the Lord had brought upon him, quote-unquote, was what is called natural evil, as opposed to moral evil. You see, uh, words have more than one meaning. Uh, in the Bible, you know the word dog, D-O-G, you know, it has two meanings. There's the dog that barks and eats, licks the sores of Lazarus. Remember that? Jesus also called a Gentile woman a dog. He thought Donald Trump was bad. <laughs> you know why he called her that? Because that's what the Jews called Gentiles, dogs. You, you got to be careful how you read the Bible. Words have meaning, and you have to look at the context. And there's natural evil, and there's moral evil. And when you read about evil in the Bible, you've got to get it right. This is how uh, Noah Webster gave us this from the Bible. Natural evil is anything which produces pain, distress, loss, or calamity, or which in any way disturbs the peace, impairs the happiness, or destroys the perfection of natural beings. Uh, Lewis has a hurt back right now. I think you ask him, he say it's evil. Yeah. I don't think he's going to say, well, I just feel so blessed mm -hmm. having a bad back. Now, he, I've talked to him before. He, he could tell you he's blessed, but the back thing isn't part of that. Uh, here's how I'm going to throw this out there again. The Bible tells us to be give thanks in all things, not give thanks for all things. Remember that. Moral evil is any deviation of a moral agent from the rules of conduct prescribed to him by God. See that? God makes the rules. He's not going to break his rules. Moral evil is violating God's rules or also legitimate human authority. God said you're supposed to obey the powers that be. So if you go against that, you're going against God, and that's likewise. 
So it's a noun, evil. It's either natural or moral. And that's what you've got to figure out when you're reading something in the Scripture. God is never guilty of moral evil, but allows natural evil. So when you're talking to that atheist friend or someone who says, well, God does evil things and God does it. God does things that are uh, called natural evil. He allows, he'll allow you to suffer the consequences of your own choices. You know, uh, I've heard people, it's terrible, but things happen. Um, there was a uh, story of a couple who got married and on their way to the honeymoon, they, the lady fell asleep in the car and they were killed on the way to the honeymoon. Now, why did God allow that? I don't know the why, but God allows natural evil and God allows your choices. What we're thankful for is how many times he intervenes. Right. He's under no obligation to do that and he does it all the time. And so, you know, go climb the top of a 30 story building and jump off, you're gonna die. Unless God intervenes some way, you're going to suffer the consequences for jumping off that building. Um, a fellow down in Cincinnati years ago was cleaning his gun, shotgun. He hunted. He he hunted for food. He wasn't. He was kind of poor. And he hunted for food, so it was important to him. He was, but he did. He did something. He knew he shouldn't have done. He cleaned his gun with it a certain way, and boom, blew his foot off. Bled to death. The family was heartbroken. He was a wonderful man. Why would God allow this? Because the guy shot his foot off. <laughs> that's, the, that's why God allowed it. You jump off a building. Why did God allow him to die? He jumped off a 30-story building. That's why God allowed it. See what I'm saying? It really is that simple. <laughs> we live in a fallen world, and it's our fault that it's in the condition it's in. We've all contributed. All of us have contributed to this darkness. Why does God allow abortion, for example? Why does God allow abortion? Well, if he didn't, then he'd not be allowing the pregnant woman, the abortionist, etc., their free will to act as they choose. And on top of that, he graciously receives the murdered babies in heaven. And if those complicit in that child's death repent toward God with faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ... They can be saved. The woman who had the abortion, the abortionist, they can be saved from eternal damnation and spend eternity with that child in the Lord's presence forever. Now, on that one, I gotta tell you, you know, if 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 God just handed all the abortionists over to a reprobate mind and, and didn't even allow them to get saved, I, I wouldn't argue with him. I'm just being honest. But you know what? God will save them. One of the men who was involved in Roe v. Wade was a man who was an abortionist. He got saved, turned pro-life later, along with the lady who was Roe. God will save them. So what I'm getting at is, you know, really we, we think a lot of times our thinking, we start wrong, so we end wrong. And then that also is used of the devil to keep us from realizing the grace of God. The long suffering. So we're going to end it on that one. I hope you had as much fun as I did. Amen. Thank you. Won't you stand with me? I'll ask my wife to give us a G. G. Uh, uppercase or lowercase? Now we were told by that some preacher around here is telling people that. Singing the B-I-B-L-E was wrong because it's uh, idolatry. Oh, uh, yep. Well, I sing a song called Old Shep. Does that mean I'm worshiping a dog? <laughs> no, it doesn't mean that. And there's this. You sing things as a way of thanksgiving to God. Amen. And even the Psalms, go back and read some of that and see how dumb that comment is that this is an act of idolatry. It's not an act of idolatry. It's a song of thanksgiving. How many of you are thankful for the Word of God? Amen. All right. How's this go? Give us a little G. The Yes, that's the book for me. 
good fellowship, good food, and just the love of Christ in us, helping one, us to love one another, to love this book. We pray, Lord, you send us out of here with hearts just full of your love, wanting to serve you by serving others, doing all that we do for the glory of God, and in Jesus' name, amen. 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 So did you make up some of those verses? No, I, I can't take credit for that. I can't remember where I got them as one of the youth... There is some other verse. You should go for the Christian song X, right? Oh, there is a verse. I am a C-H-I-A. I am a C-H-I-S-T-I-A. I never need to find the God's wonderful book to find. here because you do probably want to see the tracks Hold on okay oh that's the sign out sheet oh those are car bumper stickers I have one of each on my car and I have the black one on my laptop that I take to school uh, when I go to a liberal school so yes it's a good question are you saved I'm talking to the onliners we still have eight people watching so we might even have Ken um, I know there's Irene, there's like Jesse Bang, Earl Dressel was watching. Hello, hello, hello everybody. Oh, wanna wave hi? This is hi. my mom, she's awesome. Halfway decent. Oh, I like her. Anyway, here's the tracks. Ah, oh, Ken is there. Hey, Ken. We should talk again, man. Uh, who's the real... Ah, oh, but that's interesting. Doomtown. 
Oh yes, these were always my favorite as a kid because they're little comic books. You know how many of those I've read. Alright, let's see. Want some more videos? Might even have some kid shows, I think. Oh, what are you doing, Mom? Okay. Alright, guys, well, I think we're gonna call it a day. I'm gonna call it a night. A night? Come on, it's a, not even nine. Look. It's ten to nine. It is night, it is not day. So, want to say goodbye to the onliners? Bye, onliners. Who's on? Uh, we at least have Ken. Then Bye, we have Ken. seven others. Hello, Ken. Goodbye, Ken. Hi, <laughs> Ken. Mark, I'm still praying for you. Send me some more poems. Is Mark, I love is Mark Vass on? <laughs> I don't think Mark Vass is watching, but he'll probably watch later. So, farewell. So long. Thanks for all the fish. We'll catch you guys later. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, how are you doing?